as I listened to the news all last month, it seemed like the world was collapsing. Whether it was Charlottesville or Korea or the transgender issue in the military or the hurricane, and we could add numbers of other realities to that. In the words of, a, of an old school song, since I'm an old school guy, it was a ball of confusion. <laughs> That's what the world is today. Hey, hey. <laughs> it was seemingly chaos out of control. And then I would hear the pundits. I would hear the news media, newsmen, newswomen, whether it was CNN or MSNBC or Fox News or CNBC, all give their perspective on the ball of confusion, the chaos that was taking place. And what caught my attention was how many people were using the phrase, I think. <laughs> Volumes of human opinion trying to make sense of a culture in chaos. But perhaps we don't even have to go to the national media to raise the question, how can I make sense? You may have your own chaos that you're trying to make sense out of. Well, I'm going to take a risk with you this morning. I'm going to take a risk of trying to make sense of what you see. Now, the reason why it's a risk is because unfortunately far too many Christians have more confidence in the media than they do in the word of God. Far too many Christians have more confidence in politics than the power of scripture. So I'm on risky territory because some will not buy what I'm getting ready to share. And I risk alienating you, a risk I'm willing to take. Others, it's risky because you'll buy it, you just won't like it. But the first goal is not to win friends and influence people. In the cultural sense, it is to give you God's perspective. Let's start with a premise, a key premise. The premise is cited for us in 2 Corinthians 4.18, which says, we do not look on the things that are seen. We look on the things that are unseen. So if you can see it, touch it, taste it, feel it, and hear it, it's not where you're supposed to start. Not because it's not real, it's just not the starting blocks. If you start with the reality of your five senses and miss the invisible, to make sense of the visible. See, when you start in the wrong place, don't be shocked if you wind up lost. Or to put it in a way that I regularly say it, if all you see is what you see, you do not see all there is to be seen. Paul says, we don't start with what we see. It's real, it's there, we see it. But he says that's not where we start referring to Christians. 
He says, we start with the unseen. So that is going to be my starting point. It's going to be my starting point about Harvey, the hurricane. It's going to be about my starting point about Charlottesville and racism. Because when I start with the unseen, I don't have to start with what I think. I don't have to start with I feel or I prefer because I have a sure word. So just bear with me. I won't finish this today. I'm, it will take me till next week to finish this. Some of y'all might not come back. But judge my statements by the word of God, not by your personal ideas, thoughts, and perspectives. And most certainly, not by your television or your smart devices. The foundation where I want to start is Hebrews 12. Because in Hebrews 12, the author of Hebrews sets it right out front, the premise of our time together, beginning in verse 25. See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if those did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape who turn away from him who warns from heaven. And his voice shook the earth then, but now he has promised, saying, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken, as of created things, so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. When the hurricane made its devastating presence out of the Gulf of Mexico, the most important person at that moment, leading up to that moment and during that time was the weather man or the weather woman. They took over primacy over everything else because we wanted to know inside information on what they saw, what they prophesied, what their perspective was, what they were predicting, and people listened to it not only in the areas directly affected, but all across the nation. Our eyes were glued to the meteorological report for somebody to answer, somebody to answer Marvin Gaye's question, what's going on? Because we knew that they had more information about that sphere of knowledge, about currents and about winds and about inches of rain than we do. And they could see what was coming. And so we zeroed in on the weather man or the weather woman. I would like to suggest that when you look at what's happening in this world, you need to zero in on somebody who knows what they're talking about. Because you and I are merely observers to what's happening around us. The first thing I want you to note is it says God speaks. In verse 25 it says, see to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. God speaks in a number of ways. His foundational way of speaking is his word, his written, recorded word. He says, in times past, I spoke on earth. That is, 
through the prophets. He gave it to men. But he says, now I speak from heaven, referring to him coming to earth from heaven in the person of Jesus Christ. So God starts with his recorded word, and that is always where he starts. But we as parents know you can talk and kids still not listen. You can speak the word and they still not pay attention. You can tell them what you want them to know and they very well may ignore you. Therefore, God has another way of speaking. And he goes into these three verses and tells you the second way God speaks and the second way God speaks is by shaking things up. That's what the text says. He disturbs things. So when God sees that his word is not good enough for the culture or for the community, or even for the saints. It says he shakes things, disturbs things. He interrupts things, confuses things. A few weeks ago, we dealt with sovereignty, but let me, let me explain this now. Nothing happens, absolutely nothing happens that is not either caused by God or allowed by God. In other words, nothing just occurs. Nothing just happens. Either he made it happen or he okayed it happening because if anything could happen that he didn't cause or didn't okay, he would not be in control of all things. And again, that's why there is no luck, there is no chance, there is no happenstance, there is no fate, non-Christian words, because of a sovereign God. God speaks in shaking disturbing. The word shaking shook the earth in verse 26. Yes, once more, I'll shake the earth. Verse 27, things which can be shaken. It means there is a major interruption that disturbs the natural order of things. Let me define shaking again. It means an interruption and in how things are supposed to go. He says, when things are interrupted and you can't do anything about the interruption because it's outside of you. Look, when you, when you uh, sign an insurance policy when they used to have insurance, When you sign your insurance policy, they have a clause in there called Acts of God. That clause means if this happens, don't blame us and don't come looking for money for us because this was outside of our control. This was an act of God that we should not bear responsibility for. When the text says God shakes things up, he's referring to acts of God. And you know God is shaking it because you can't fix it. And you don't know anybody else who can because it has been orchestrated by God himself. Therefore, when things get shaken, disturbed, you get messed up over something that wasn't supposed to happen. First question, isn't Democrats, Republicans, or Independents? It's not first a social question. It's not first a class question. Something else is going on here when something gets shaken that's not supposed to happen. 
in our world and in your life. When God shakes, disturbs, interrupts, is because he's talking. He says, do not refuse him who speaks through shaking. I, uh, growing up as a boy in Baltimore, regularly on Friday night, I went over to my grandmother's house, grandfather's house, to eat crabs. If you are from Baltimore, you eat crabs. It comes with the territory of living in the vicinity of the Chesapeake Bay. Crabs are a social gathering point. When I went home to visit my father a few days ago, we set the plan to go get the crabs because that comes with the territory. So I would go over my grandmother and grandfather's house to get my crabs and uh, sometimes I'd spend the night. Now, if I went over on Friday and spent the night, that means Saturday morning I'm getting up to watch cartoons, and my favorite cartoon was Mighty Mouse. Oh, somebody remembers Mighty Mouse? Here he comes to save the day. That means that Mighty Mouse is on the way. There was something about that mouse that caught my undivided attention. He was a hero rodent, <laughs> mighty mouse. But don't let it start storming with thunder and lightning when mighty mouse or one of the other cartoons are playing. Because then my grandmother would tell me I got to turn off the time. Somebody had a grandmother like that. My grandmama would tell me, you, got, you better turn off that television. I say, Ma, Grandma, why I got to turn off the television? Mighty Mouse getting ready to hurt somebody. Why I got to turn off the television now? And her answer would always be, because God is talking. She says, God is talking because he's interrupted your regular programming. When God interferes with the regular programming of life called being shaken, it's because he's talking. He says in verse 25, do not refuse him who is speaking. Well, that assumes, number one, you know he's talking. Because if you just assume it's a storm, you just assume it's a weird election, you just assume the racial situation is as it, you just looking at what you see. You haven't started with what God might be saying. So unfortunately, far too many people and unfortunately far too many Christians are starting in the wrong place. They're starting in a Republican place or a Democratic place or, or a meteorological place. That's not where you start. You start with what is he saying? And he says, not only must you understand that he is talking, you must understand what he is saying when he speaks. That's why we ask people, do you understand me? Because they might hear you, but not understand you. And then when you understand what he's saying, he says in verse 25, and don't refuse me. Watch this. When I warn you from heaven. He connects his speaking to a warning when it involves shaking. God speaks when he interrupts the normal processes of things that you can't fix because heaven has something to say to earth that 
God wants you to pay complete attention to. And his purpose in his speech is always the same. He's separating. He speaks to separate. Isn't that what verse 27 says? This expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken as of created things so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Okay. When God shakes your world, when he rocks your world with something that interrupts your world or the world, it is because he is in the process of creating a correction. Thus, the phrase warning. What is he trying to correct in his, in his speech? First by his word and then by his shaking. He is trying to correct the fact that the physical has trumped the spiritual. It's always that, that's always going to be the message in some form or fashion. So he's trying to get things back in its right location. So he shakes the things that can be shaken, that is, as of created things, the things that are in the physical world. He shakes them so that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. He's putting things back in its rightful place. He's after a correction. So I'm going to take a risk here and make, a, make a, 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 a prophetic statement that the reason you have Harvey is because you had Charlottesville. Folk out there fighting, racism rising his head, reaction, clashes, People taking sides. Folk are divided, which is against God. I'm going to talk more about that next week. But which is against God. So God said, oh, I know how to get them together. They ain't going to fight no more when I come up in here. So all of a sudden, he calls on a man named Harvey. And he says, Harvey, I want you to come in there and I want you to teach them, can we all get along? Because we're going to make this thing so bad that folk ain't going to be asking about color or class or culture. Because when you drowning, you don't clear that it's a black man saving a white man or a white woman saving a white girl. heard anything about Ku Klux Klan. I haven't heard anything about white supremacists. I haven't heard anything about all right. Because you see, when you're in a war, you don't care about the color, class, or culture of the man fighting next to you as long as he's shooting in the same direction you are. So what God has done is he blows through and creates, but if you don't know that, all you see is a storm. All you see is water rising and, and dams being let loose and all you see is a homeless situation, but what you don't see is God is reacting to something out of order. And the big tragedy is that Christians and churches don't see it either. So we, we allow politics to illegitimately divide us. We let Democrats and Republicans divide us. As though God sits on the backs of donkeys or elephants. No, he's the king of kings and lord of lords and he's after a whole nother agenda. God is saying when I shake things up, it's because I got something to say. When Jesus was with his disciples on the Sea of Galilee in Mark 4, it says there was a storm. There was a storm. They panicked because this was something they couldn't control. Jesus got up and said, oh, ye of little faith. Why? Because you didn't get the reason for the storm. 
The reason for the storm had a spiritual purpose to it. So let me let you in on a secret for your personal life, your family life, our church, and most certainly for the world watching. Here's the secret. When God creates a disruption in your world, when he rocks your world and it's outside of your control, he is speaking and he's only saying one overriding thing. Something is out of sync. And I want you to get that thing right so that the spiritual trumps the physical. So that the, the things that aren't created trumps the things that are created. So that eternal trumps time. Heaven trumps earth. Now, don't get me wrong. It's, you're not ignoring it. You're not, you're not pretending it's not real. It's just not where you start. You always start with the question, when God shakes stuff, God, what are you doing? What are you trying to tell me? What are you trying to teach me? What are you trying to clarify to me? You know, when you, when you, when you, go, to, when you go to a funeral, all of a sudden spiritual things become real important. You ain't thinking about your job. You're not thinking about your people. You're not thinking about, you know, you think about that could be me. Because funerals have a way of disturbing your natural existence because it shows you something eternal is at work. God allows things to happen or causes things to happen depending upon the scenario in order to wake us up to his reality. But if you aren't looking for it, you're going to refuse him who's speaking because you don't even know he's talking. You just think, oh, poor me, this is what happened to me. You're not looking at it, starting with the work of God. So he has to tell even these Christians he's writing to, he says, do not refuse him who's speaking just because God is shaking your world. He's shaking your world because he's trying to accomplish something. When a woman is in labor, when a woman is in labor, she's in pain. She's hurting, but the only reason she's hurting is because a separation is about to occur. It's painful because a separation is in movement. But the only reason the separation is, is, is coming is because new life is seeking to emerge. God wants to do something new. He wants to do something different. He wants to bring about a correction, and sometimes that involves labor pains, hurricane pains, political pains, social pains, economic pains to bring about a correction. But without this perspective, then you ignore the shaking. And all you see is what you see. And therefore, the eternal doesn't get a hearing. It doesn't get a voice. And that only means if you don't hear the word and you're not listening to the shaking, then he has to take it to the next level. Because you apparently either not listening or you don't want to hear. And that always starts with the household of faith. See, we will never get it together out there until we get it together in here. I mean, why, why in the world do we think God's going to fix the White House when he can't even get a hearing in the church house? Look at this backwards, because... Because God's people do not want to place the spiritual above the physical. Now, let me be more specific since we are wrestling with the current realities of Houston. That's on the table today and in the consciousness of the culture. I've alluded to it, but I want to be more specific. There is no such thing as impersonal forces of a mother called nature. Okay? Let's get this straight. I'm glad they give hurricanes name, Harvey, Katrina, 
you know, a guy and a girl. What, you know what they're doing? They're establishing personhood to the storm. They're giving it a human name, okay? Well, there is personhood to the storm, but it ain't Harvey and it ain't Katrina. There are no impersonal forces of nature. Now, I know you heard that in biology and you, you heard all that. Now, okay. So if you, if you took this sermon, if you took this sermon so far and you, you went out and you said, no, 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 God's behind all this. And somebody asked you to prove it from the word of God. Could you prove it or would you? You just be saying, well, my pastor said it, so. Okay, so let's go to scripture. So that one, you know that I'm not making this up. And two, that you can defend what is being said. Let's look first at Job chapter 37. That comes before Psalms. Job chapter 37, verse 3 says, Under the whole heaven, he lets it loose. And his lightning to the ends of the earth. After it, a voice roars, he thunders, and his majestic voice, and he does not restrain the lightning when his voice is heard. God thunders with his voice wondrously doing great things which we cannot comprehend. For the snow, he says, fall on the earth. And to the downpour and the rain, he says, be strong. He seals the hand of every man that all men may know his work. Then the beasts go into the lair, lair and remain in its den. Out of the south comes the storm and out of the north the cold. From the breath of God, ice is made, and the expanse of the waters is frozen. Also with moisture, he loads the thick cloud. He dispenses the cloud of his lightning. It changes direction, turning around by his guidance, that it may do whatever he commands on the face of the inhabited earth. So, so far, there's no such thing as impersonal weather, whether it's caused by a personal God. But why? Verse 13, whether for correction or for his world or for loving kindness, he causes it to happen. So Mr. Harvey or Miss Katrina, was simply obeying Father God. Because he causes it to happen. Psalm 147 verse 18 says the same thing, that God is behind the weather. Lamentations, chapter 3, right after Jeremiah. Verse 31, For the Lord will not reject forever, for if he causes grief, then he will have compassion according to his abundant loving kindness. For he does not afflict willingly or grieve the sons of men. So he causes it, but not because he's trying to be mean. He's trying to fix something. And then I love Amos. I love Amos. Because Amos chapter 4 verses 6 to 8 says this. For I give you also cleanness of teeth in all your cities and the lack of bread in all your places. You have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Furthermore, I withheld the rain from you while there were still three months until harvest. Then I would send rain on one city and on another city I would not send rain. One part would be rained on while the part not rained on would dry up. So two or three cities would stagger to another city to drink water, but would not be satisfied. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I didn't let it rain and you wouldn't return to me. I let it rain too much, you wouldn't let it return to me. 
You stuck in long gas lines because you wouldn't return to me? You just, you just inconvenience, but you don't get the message. It's not about the water. It's not about the gas. It's about me. I have never heard so much talk about prayer. Every time my television on, the, the pagans praying, the atheists praying, the White House praying, everybody praying, everybody talking about prayer. God is all over the place. Let's talk to God. God, how all of a sudden you are getting all this attention? Because I told Mr. Harvey to show up. All of a sudden, he's not being pushed to the side. So you can praise him voluntarily or you can praise him mandatorily, but God is going to get the glory one way or another. But if you're not looking at what happens through those eyes, then you will only deal with what you see and you will be limited by that. One more, Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 13. Hope you see it's not impersonal, it's personal. When he utters his voice, there is a tumult of waters in the heavens, and he causes the clouds to ascend from the end of the earth and make lightning for the rain, and he brings out the winds from his storehouse. Now, you got lightning, you got wind, you got rain, sound like a hurricane to me. And it says, he causes it. So you must personify, not because God is being mean. I know you got those voices that say, oh, God must be just. You just can't automatically say that. But God is using what he allows to bring attention back to him. Because he's always seeking to make the spiritual more important than the physical. In one act. He addressed racism in one act. He adults, uh, addressed uh, uh, separatism in one act. He made people who were enemies become brothers for a little while in one act. He made people care in one act. He showed you when God moves, it doesn't take long. It doesn't take 240 years. It, it doesn't take seminars and workshops. It just takes people seeing a need, responding to what God did to overcome what men are unable to resolve. And when you start looking at your life that way and your circumstances and ask the God question first, responding to his word and to the circumstance, ah, oh, now, now you are hearing from heaven. Most of you in here at some point in your life have vomited, regurgitated. Oh, let's get down to it. You throw up. <laughs> the reason you throw up is because something is wrong. Food poisoning or virus or bacteria, something not right. Something not right, and all of a sudden, there's discomfort in the belly. Discomfort in the belly, and you things are not done not right. You, uh, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Look, next time you want to throw up, don't fight it. <laughs> don't fight it, because what your belly is trying to tell you is a separation needs to occur. Yeah. See, you if you try to hold it in you keep in transformation from a curry. And so, yeah, I know it hurts and I know it's uncomfortable, but, but it wants to escape, it wants to get out. Now, I will concede it is messy. Vomiting, regurgitating, that, that's messy. Doesn't smell right, it doesn't feel right, it's messy, but oh, it feels so good after you get it out. When God wants society to vomit, when he wants culture to throw up, when he wants a separation to occur, he, he brings about discomfort. Not because he's just being mean, but what he is saying is, you got me in the wrong place. You got me in the wrong place. You, you, done, you done put me on to the side somewhere, so I'm going to let you know I'm not a sideline kind of deity. 
I'm not a sideline kind of God. So he will make a culture throw up so that things can be made right. Now, I'm not unaware that this might not last long. But God's got some other names out there he ain't used yet. But it starts with us being the people of God, responding to his correction in our own lives so that he can use us to affect a world that is in chaos. Now, if Jesus is getting ready to come back, that's the vomit. So if Jesus is getting ready to come back, then all this chaos is supposed to be happening to set the stage. But if Jesus is not yet ready to come up, he's allowing this chaos to bring about correction. But if you refuse him who is speaking, then the ante gets up. 